secfans.com and man it is week 10 already this season is crazy flying by i've got my buddy josh in the house we're going to get nerdy with y'all again this week we've got three games and then we're going to talk about the florida firing of coach mac uh down there in gainesville but first we're going to get to alabama lsu and i always remind y'all at the end but i'm going to remind you at the at the beginning if you like what we're saying please give us a thumbs up. If you don't like it, we'd love for you to also give us a thumbs down and follow up with a comment and let us know where we're wrong so we can engage with you in in the comments there. And if you really love it, how about a subscribe from y'all? We, we, we love that so much. So, um, all right. So LSU and Alabama, this is interesting because every year this is a huge game. And then midway through the season with LSU sort of faltering, uh, if you were looking ahead on the schedule, you'd say... Man, that Alabama LSU game is not that going to be that big of a deal. And then LSU turns around and beats Auburn, which we're going to be reminded, I'm sure, in the comments that we actually missed that pick. Um, and it's put some hype back into this game. Alabama fans are a little uncomfortable. They're no longer, uh, they maybe penciled this win in, but I don't think it's in ink anymore. And uh, I think having that bye week for both teams sort of adds to the mystique of this game. We're going to talk about the computer model later, but let's just get a summary of where Alabama and LSU are up to this point, and maybe talk about some matchups where you think each could take advantage of the other. LSU is, in some ways, the least predictable team in football. Now, we've done a bunch of models on this show, and we've generally been pretty successful for them. I think, you know, do you, do you know off the top of your head what we are against the spread? Uh, I think against the spread this year, we are 15, three and have two pushes. Okay. So with that in mind, 15, three and two, two of the games I know that were misses were LSU and that was LSU, Mississippi state and LSU Auburn. Right. So in a sense, LSU is probably the least predictable team in football. They are not playing to any consistent standard. It's really hard to judge where they're going to be week to week. We talk about this a lot. Sometimes you can predict things. Sometimes you can't. We sort of predict an average game, the B-plus game for both teams. LSU is coming out sometimes playing an A game, sometimes playing a C game. I do think LSU has certain verifiable weaknesses. LSU's rush defense in particular has not been particularly good this year. Uh, a lot of it is due to depth issues. That's understandable. Everybody's sort of aware of that, but really that Auburn game, that Auburn win was a bit of an aberration against Ole Miss. They give up about 5.5 yards per carry in outside that the rest of the season. The only other team that they held uh, below five yards per carry, they did Chatt Chattanooga, Syracuse and BYU. BYU probably uh, having contention for the worst offense in the country. But Florida got over five yards per carry. Mississippi State got about six yards per carry. Again, Ole Miss about five and a half. Troy got about five yards per carry. So I think LSU is not as stout in the front seven. I think just as importantly, I don't think they play gaps as well. I think White's a good linebacker. I don't know that they have the general overall quality at linebacker. I don't think they have the quality at safety, which is very important. When you have a guy like Jamal Adams that's an enforcer, it can clean up a lot of other issues too. And so really at all three levels, they've lost guys that are really good tacklers. Now, LSU is still a very good pass defense, and I think that's shown up at times. It particularly shows up when teams like to throw vertically in man coverage because LSU still has very long, athletic, lanky corners that can survive on an island. And I think that was something that gave Auburn fits. I think it was something that helped them with Florida but wasn't necessarily dominant. And against a much more spreadish team like against Troy – it wasn't as much of a factor. And, you know, I also think it's something that really helped them in the blowout of Ole Miss because Ole Miss likes to chunk it down the ball over repeatedly, take a lot of 50 50 shots. And LSU was more or less able to stomp that out and only gave up about 5.7 yards per attempt. It's interesting to me that they gave up less yards per attempt against Ole Miss than they did against Florida. And I think that's sort of indicative of where their strengths are uh, at, because the, the corners are just so good in man coverage in those situations. I think where they really struggle is with a team like Mississippi State that doesn't try to either pound the ball or take vertical shots. Instead, they sort of spread it side to side. Mississippi State, right now, they create a lot of mismatches offensively. That's their whole MO. They don't have a prototypical deep threat. They don't really have an excellent power run game. 
But what they can do is they can strain your assignments by having a quarterback that can run, solid running backs, and they have a lot of shifty receivers. And formationally, they're, they're really varied and they do a lot of things to create space matchups. So I think that's, to me, that's LSU in, in a nutshell defensively. They're really good when they get to play an offense that's fairly straightforward, when they can sit in man coverage and just play the thing that's in front of them. But when they actually have to move and react, they're just frankly not a very well-coached team. And Mississippi State was the primary example of that because Mississippi State, more than anything, when you play them defensively, the key is, are you doing the right thing to keep them from having an easy completion? Because they're not going to try to out-athlete you one-on-one. They know they can't do that. They're going to try to create some sort of mismatch. LSU let that happen way too often in that game. We've talked about that ad nauseum over the course of the season. Offensively, LSU is about as limited as they have been. We talked a lot last year about how Geis is a very good tailback, but his numbers were a little bit inflated because he came in when Fournette was hurt, and Fournette was hurt in a four-game stretch that was extremely easy. We've all seen this year, and it really was true last year, just how terrible the rush defenses are at Missouri and Arkansas. And really, I think last year, those games, the Ole Miss game, it gave everyone a little bit of an inflated sense of where the running game was. I think the running game is pretty good, but we talk about a lot that if you if you try to just run it up the gut and you don't have much explosive potential because you don't really have a variety of weapons and be able to move the ball, it gets hard to score. And our running theme this year has been, it, it's really impressive how many yards LSU can accrue and how successful they can be offensively and not score a whole heck of a lot. They got seven yards per play against Troy. They only score 21 points. They get six and a half against BYU, score 27. And if you flip that around and you look at, say, what Alabama does in that same context, when Alabama had seven, seven and a half yards per play, they're scoring 41 points. They had 7.3 yards per play. They scored 59 points against Vanderbilt. Uh, LSU just takes an unusually high, really, yard per play numbers because there's so little explosive offense. It's just hard for them to score points. The Auburn game, they hit a couple big plays, and that's how they were able to do it. Their yard per play total of 5.67 wasn't that impressive, but they had a couple big plays that let them get just a couple touchdowns on the board, and because Auburn couldn't score a lot, that's all it took. I, I don't know that's that's going to be the case in this game, but I think that's your basic synopsis of LSU. And, and LSU fans have all tuned out now because your synopsis just said basically they suck. And I don't think you're saying that. I'm going to give you an opportunity to sort of clarify that in, in a minute. But I do wonder, so a lot of times instead of looking at unit performance or player performance or how schemes are working or not working, a lot of times we try to do play that transitive property card of, you know, you got blown out 37-7 to Miss State or you lost to Troy, therefore you're not a good team, which is what everybody outside the SEC is going to say about LSU. And I really disagree with that. But if we're not looking at that just transitive property and sort of trying to translate that into how they face, how they fare against Alabama, talk a little bit about how is this the same LSU team that lost to Troy and got blown out by Miss State, or have some of the getting some of the players back, getting Arden Key a little more acclimated to the, to the game again? Has that sort of recomposed this team into a completely different team than what we saw earlier in the year? Are they the same team, or is it a mixture of both? It's definitely a mixture of both. LSU early in the year was really suffering from injuries and issues on the offensive and defensive line. They just didn't have a lot of impact players. And the Troy game really was defined by the fact that they lost the line of scrimmage pretty consistently in that game, I think. Arden Key is out of shape still, but he's still a very good player. And he can make some serious athletic plays that that defense needs. More importantly, he's a very experienced player that's played a lot of important football in a lot of clutch situations and those little plays, one or two here and there, make a difference. It, it doesn't take many third down stops to change the course of a game. One third and two tackle for a loss can be the difference in a drive that changes seven points, flips field position, and lets you score a field goal, and it's a 10-point swing in a close game. That's kind of, to me, been the difference. And LSU has been able to run the ball a lot more successfully because the offensive line it is gelled a little bit. They were super discombobulated due to injuries and other issues. I mean, they had three, three true freshmen on the line at one point, and you can't produce like that. But 
I still think they do have general issues. I mean, they're not great against the run. They're still giving up about 99% of opponent rush averages. Again, they're pretty solid against the pass, 85% of opponent pass averages, but it's still not necessarily elite. And if I were to draw a parallel statistically, really LSU statistically, now don't don't jump on my case here because I'm just sort of comparing numbers to numbers, is actually really similar to Tennessee, but with a slightly more potent offense. That That is what LSU is right now. They're a touch better in rush defense than Tennessee. They're about the same in pass defense. And I would say their offense is about 30% better. And if that sounds crazy, again, I try to make comparative points. The Florida game, right, is a down-to-the-wire game between Florida and LSU where Florida just doesn't quite squeak out the win at the end. Florida-Tennessee was also a down-to-the-wire game where Florida was able to throw a Hail Mary to win the game at the very end. So we already kind of know, and I get that LSU won that game, but let's understand that LSU and Florida, for the most part, seemed fairly evenly matched. Florida and Tennessee seem fairly evenly matched. So if you're an Alabama fan going into this, I think you could look back at the Tennessee game, which was just the last game on their schedule, and say, okay, LSU is a little bit better offensively than Tennessee. They're going to move the ball a little bit more. Etling is a, is a better passer, on, in my opinion, than Garantano. Uh, the offensive line and run game is a little more consistent, partly because they actually are willing to run the ball consistently. That's a different issue. But defensively, I think what you saw from Tennessee is not far too far off from LSU. They're still pretty darn serviceable. I mean, Tennessee is a pretty serviceable defense in a lot of ways, but uh, they're not necessarily elite. They've been a little bit uh, helped by some of the offenses they faced. I think the Auburn game, I still don't know what to make with that. I don't know if it's an aberration or not. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it's a mixture of both. I think they're still a little bit who they were. They've improved because of better players. And I think they've also p- played some teams particularly Auburn and Ole Miss, they have a lot of other issues. Troy uh, was good, and then Florida is who knows what they are, and they seem to be imploding. And it makes it really hard to draw a comparison uh, week to week because the teams are so hot and cold they've played. I think personally they are kind of who they have been through the start, since the start of the year. I think they have particular deficiencies. I think they're a little more stable now, but I don't necessarily th- think everything's been corrected. I don't know that that's entirely fair. It's probably and and a lot of LSU fans are going to kill you for for kind of not even hedging, sort of saying, yeah, the LSU is a, a lot of who they've been all year. Um, but I, I think what you're doing is what you always do, and that's being fair to what the numbers say. And I appreciate that, but we also have to realize that I feel like the, the LSU team that lost to Mississippi State and lost to Troy isn't coming back from a 20 nothing deficit against Auburn. So I think something has changed, maybe in mentality, maybe getting some of those players back that has sort of turned their perspective around a little bit, giving them a little more fire. Um, and I could believe could be completely off base there, but that's just kind of how I'm reading it a little bit. I'm going to force you at this point because <laughs> I've given you an opportunity to sort of bring it back around to positivity for LSU. I'm going to force you a little bit to say, okay, in the context of this game against Alabama, and we've seen an LSU team that struggled throughout the season give Alabama all they wanted uh, in a, in seasons prior. Having said all of what you just said about LSU. Give me a place where LSU could potentially give Alabama some fits and have a lot of success. I think the LSU pass defense is pretty darn good. I think they're physical. I think they play good in man coverage. And a lot of what Alabama does offensively right now is predicated on winning matchups outside. They struggle quite a bit when they deal with physical receivers because, one, they don't throw the ball well enough to really create Big plays offensively if guys aren't wide open. Jalen Hurts has issues, I think, pulling the trigger proactively the way he should. And they're not going to get a ton of separation against LSU. And and that may make Jalen Hurts pretty tentative. The other thing is, and we've seen this for a couple years now, Alabama really struggles with blitzes from corners and safeties and even sometimes outside linebackers in their play selection. Jalen Hurts, for whatever reason, the past two years still hasn't really figured out how to deal with a corner blitz. And the team that figured that out last year was LSU. 
that blitz Jackson a ton. Now LSU, I think was smart enough to sort of reconfigure the secondary so that they can get Jackson a little closer to the line of scrimmage and let him be back in that role, blitzing off uh, out of that nickel slot or what have you. And I think that's something they can do that can be very effective because last year it was extremely effective. It was almost comical to me the way LSU was able to control the game defensively by just bringing a corner blitz. And it seemed like Alabama never really had an answer to it. I think Hertz doesn't make the hot read. I think more importantly, I think they don't see the blitz. And most of the time when you see it, you make a check. You tell the, you tell the running back, all right, you've got to block that blitzing corner and you check to a quick slant or something, and you you hit that receiver on a hitch or a slant, and you exploit it. You don't really. It's not the hot read in the sense that you just snap the ball and go. You actually have to make an audible pre snap. And I, I don't know that Jalen maybe had the familiarity last year. Again, true freshman, very little time with the playbook. Absolutely not his fault. It, it's that's there's a reason teams struggle. There's a reason Florida State struggles right now so badly with black minute quarterback. There's a lot of the playbook that gets thrown out, and there's a lot of things a freshman just doesn't have the understanding of the offense to deal with. I, I think that's an issue, the area that LSU actually could be extremely effective. Um, and, and I think offensively, Alabama's run offense has been really good. But sometimes you can get side to side on Alabama. For years now, their linebackers can play really tight to the line of scrimmage, and they're so aggressive and big that sometimes they struggle with the you know, jet sweep game or what have you. Canada does a really good job of inventing ways for the offense to be productive in the Auburn game. And I know I was being really derisive earlier, but in the Auburn game, I think you have to acknowledge that 14 points came off a jet sweep and a kick, right? So LSU found ways to put points on the board, even though the offense wasn't being quote unquote, all that productive, they still scored. And a lot of that is what Canada has been able to do in this offense. We talked about the Troy game. Troy was the game where Orgeron didn't really let Canada do his offense do his thing. And they tried to run that offense by just playing, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust and seeing what they could get out of it. Well, the, the trick is if you're not doing anything fancy and you just try to pound it straight ahead with no originality, same thing we saw with Les Miles. It doesn't matter how well you're running in a per play sense. You, you have to march all the way down the field and never do anything wrong because you really have no potential to get out of bad down and distance. And you know, have, you don't have any explosiveness. The way Oregon scored years back when they were so good and they ran that zone read offense is they would hit you over and over again with a zone read and you'd start getting a little tired and then they'd do one little pop pass or one jet sweep or they would do something with a misdirection to hit you for a 50-yard touchdown. And that's how they blew games open. It wasn't really that they drove the ball down the field all that well. In fact, at times when they played a team like Stanford that could sort of slow them down, they would stall they scored because they would get you on the heels so that they could do some sort of misdirection. That's what Canada has been able to do to generate offense. Auburn did a lot of that too for, for Alabama fans that are maybe familiar with, you know, the Auburn, the 2013 Auburn team, they did a, a whole lot of that as well. Right. It's, it's not all that different from what Malzahn does. And there's a lot of ways you can sort of hide it, but what these coaches do is they say, okay, we know we're a ground and pound team. And we're going to put a lot of window dressing that most of the time doesn't matter, but occasionally it will. And the moment you fall asleep on that stuff because you're struggling with the ground and pound, then we're going to hit you with a big play. We're going to hit you with Gage, who I think is a tremendous athlete on a jet sweep. It only takes a couple of those plays to put points on the board. And you, last year was a 10 to nothing game, right? And it wouldn't have taken a lot, just one play like that, one bit of originality to make that a tremendously closer ball game. I think LSU has the capability to do that because they have some creativity creativity at offensive coordinator, even despite all the issues that I discussed earlier. I, I agree with you. I, I think, too, uh, last year, that 10 nothing game, you, you've got the same defensive coordinator there that took advantage and exploited some of Jalen Hurts' weaknesses, but I think you've got a much improved uh, offensive mind, uh, at least – catering towards the college game and, and the personnel he has. So let's talk a little bit about Alabama because we've we've gone long on, on LSU. And I want to talk about – so Alabama last week or two weeks ago really because they had, had a bye week, blew Tennessee out of the water. I think we kind of knew that was coming. Um, and Alabama fans were frustrated in the first half because they – right now they're playing that transitive property comparative game – 
to Georgia. And Alabama, with I think five minutes left in the first half, was looking at a 7 nothing kind of game and saying, okay, wow, Georgia blew these guys out of the water. We're kind of struggling to score the ball. Uh, talk a little bit about how that maybe wasn't necessarily telling the whole truth in terms of points scored per, per drive or per play. Um, just because I think you noticed something in that that um, maybe a lot of Alabama fans didn't see. Something we've talked about from time to time is that tempo and situations for offense really can skew the way you perceive an offense's effectiveness. One team that we've really pegged this with is Louisville under Bobby Petrino. And the example that I've gone back to a lot uh, was, I think it was, they played Syracuse one week where they scored like 52 points and a half. And that was Lamar Jackson went off and everybody was going crazy because he scored these, I think six or seven touchdowns. But we noted they had, I think 13 possessions that half. And in a per play sense, when you broke it down, they were the same as Vanderbilt was that week. They just had the ball so much that they queued a ton of points, partly because their defense was actually quite good and you know the opposing offense wasn't very good and they were going three and out constantly, and partly because they took tons and tons of deep shots. So when they did score, they scored quickly, but we noted they were actually prob- more likely in that game, I think, to turn the ball over and go three, or they either went three and out or turned it over more often than they scored, even though they put 60 points in the ball game. It was just surely a function of how much they had the ball. Obviously, this isn't a complete metaphor to the current situation, but there's some similarities here. Georgia had eight drives in the first half. Most teams have about 12 a ball game is uh, is average. So eight drives in the first half was a ton. And that was because one, Tennessee turned the ball over three times in the first half against Georgia. And two, Tennessee threw for 45% of their plays with Dormady. And against Alabama, they only threw for 33%. So what does that mean for Alabama? Well, rather than getting eight offensive drives, Alabama only got five offensive drives. And Alabama, in those five drives, they scored three touchdowns and they punted twice. That was 21 points in five drives. In five drives against Tennessee, Georgia only had 10 points. In fact, in the first half with eight possessions, Georgia had three touchdowns, three punts, an interception, and a field goal. So in a sense, they got three extra drives in the game, and those from those three drives, they produced a punt, an INT, and a field goal. In fact, they produced those before they started scoring against Tennessee. Uh, and in the second half, it's actually kind of a similar story. Alabama had... Uh, three touchdowns, they had a field goal, and they had a pick six by the backup quarterback. In the second half against Tennessee, Georgia had two touchdowns, two punts, and a field goal. Alabama never punted in the second half against Tennessee. So in a per-play sense, Alabama was significantly more effective scoring. Uh, it, it's actually even a little bit worse because of those first-half drives I talked about where Georgia had eight first-half drives, only two of those eight drives went for more than 26 yards. And the crazy thing is that they can have eight drives, six of which go 26 yards or less, and they scored 24 points in that first half. And and it really just was a function of the fact that Tennessee fumbled a few times, they turned the ball over, uh, they were throwing it a ton so that they were ending up having to punt faster, they weren't burning the clock as fast. And against Alabama with a mobile quarterback, and we've talked about this a lot, if you have a run trying to maintain run pass balance with a mobile quarterback. What tends to end up happening is um, depending on how you want to balance it. If you want the quarterback to have about the same amount of touches. Well, if Dormini has 25 touches in a game uh, that they're all passes and you want Garantano to have 25 meaningful touches, some of those are going to be runs. So he throws the ball less. He runs the ball more. Uh, That's kind of what we saw in the first half of the Alabama game. They ran the ball of significantly more often. It meant the clock ran down faster And I think one of the big things that gets skewed is because of CBS and ESPN, frankly. Uh, CBS and ESPN, they have a certain amount of time they want to have to take. And so they will intentionally call more TV timeouts because they know at each point in the game, at the end of the first quarter, halfway through the second quarter, they won't have had so many commercial breaks due to their advertisement contracts. Well, when you have a game like the Alabama-Tennessee game where the game's actually going pretty quickly because there's so many runs – they call more of those. So it feels like the offense is slower because the offense isn't on the field as much, if that makes sense. It's interrupted a lot more. Georgia, Tennessee, because they were throwing the ball, the clock was stopping. CBS knew that the game was going to take 
you know, let's say 90 minutes for the first half, just because the clock getting kept being stopped against Alabama. They really, they really felt like they had to stop the clock themselves. And so you sit there and you go, Oh man, it's been 90 minutes. They've only scored uh, 14 points. Man, Georgia was, was up on them fast. It's like, yeah, okay. You know, Georgia scored 24 points in the first half. Alabama only scored 21, but that was because, you know, Georgia managed to squeeze in eight drives in that same period of time that Alabama probably squeezed in four. It really all screws with perception. And the reality of it is, you know, Alabama scored on four of their five, first five possessions against Fresno State and Vanderbilt. They scored on three of their first five possessions against Old Miss, Colorado State, Arkansas, and Tennessee. So if you think the Old Miss game or the Arkansas game started quickly, Tennessee game started just as quickly for Alabama. Uh, they had a little bit more of an extended drive, but in large part, I think Tennessee was really just trying to play the game out so they wouldn't be blown out as badly. I mean, I hate to say it, but I really felt like Butch Jones called that game to avoid a blowout rather than to win. Uh, really kind of shorten the game. But in, in when you quote unquote shorten the game, what it really does is it reduces the number of plays and then it drags out how long those plays take. You end up scoring less points. And that's how I think the perceptions got ab- so absolutely skewed in that ball game. So you've had some criticism. We both had some criticisms of Jalen Hurts in the past. And we talked about what, you know, I just asked you where could LSU exploit Alabama and some of that is is on Jalen's not you know inability to maybe get to that next level in terms of passing. We both but we both think he's improved. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about two areas where we've seen him improve. Once in an, one area is an actual play, uh, and then another area is is the actual numbers compared to last year. And you probably don't have those numbers handy, so I'm going to stall a little bit, and maybe you can dig them up. But earlier this week, you and I were reviewing some film and talking about a little bit about Jalen Hurts because there's there's still that frustration um, from Alabama fans, especially when Tua comes in, they're slinging it all over the place, uh, that maybe Jalen Hurts hasn't progressed as a passer. But we've noticed some stuff. Um, we're going to talk about that stuff. So one of the things is um, – a pretty classic Alabama play that's been around forever, uh, dating back to, to Coach McElwain era, where uh, y- y- they roll out the quarterback, cut the field in half, um, and historically it's been a one read, you know, dump to the flat, either a, a pull out, like a, I think it's a, uh, a tight end that comes comes with him. It might be a tailback, but I think it's a tight end. Um, and – but there's also a trailing wide receiver come from the other side. Uh, and I want you to talk about that play in particular, about what we noticed on film, and also talk about how we've noticed a couple times this year in Alabama games that they've forced Jalen Hurts to stay in the pocket. And they did some of this last year. And Saban's really good about working on stuff in these blowouts uh, to help bring players along in specific areas. So I want you to show us a little bit in the numbers a comparison of Jalen Hurts in a situation like that last year versus what we've seen this year where they said, Jalen, don't run it. Just operate the offense and be a, a pocket quarterback. Okay, so a lot to talk about right there. Uh, I'll deal with the first ex- thing you mentioned f- initially, and that's the rollout to the tight end. So one of the most common plays for Alabama, I feel like for the past 10 years, has been a bootleg throw to the tight end where they fake the power run, move the tight end ac- back uh, opposite, you know, opposite the play, and bootleg the quarterback and throw to the tight end. And what what that's really designed to do is to say, okay, you've got an outside linebacker. If that outside linebacker is chasing the power run from behind. If he follow, crashes down weak side, follows the running back that's uh, moving to the power side of the formation, he's not available to take the tight end, so the tight end tends to be open. If he stays with the tight end, now you tend to have a conflict because what they often do is they'll take the receiver from the opposite side of the formation or tight end, and they will drag him deep. So he'll be about 15 yards deep, and the tight end will be about three yards deep. Last year, something we commented on a lot, and there was actually a big example, I think, of the Tennessee game, he would often have O.J. Howard open almost immediately on that play because he was such a good athlete, he would just get open quickly. He'd outrun the linebacker, and Hertz was really nervous throwing the ball. And we couldn't quite figure out or decide whether it was hesitancy, which I think it was somewhat, And I think some of it was just footwork, and you hear this a lot. One of the sneaky, difficult things about playing at this level is you see the tight end, you want to throw it. If you're crossing your feet as you run and you don't have your plant foot in the right place, you can't throw the ball yet, and you've got to take a full step 
to reset your feet to be in the proper posture to throw an accurate football. I think those two things compounded, and a lot of times what we would see is Howard would be wide open, and then the linebacker would kind of catch up, a corner would come down, and they'd throw right to the sticks, and Howard would catch the ball running out of bounds for a five-yard play, when if he'd thrown it way earlier, it would have been a 15 or more yard play because Howard could have turned up field. In the Tennessee game, there was a big play where they hit uh, they hit, instead of, you know, they roll out and the outside linebacker takes the tight end. The middle linebacker reads the play, comes around, uh, I think the play boot to the right. So the middle linebacker comes around right tackle and is getting in Hertz' face. And Hertz, not only does he realize quickly that there's a blitz coming, but he looks at the tight end and then he looks off and he finds the crossing receiver at the second level and he hits him. And so... At the point where he's not released the ball yet to the tight end, his first read last year, and leading to about a four-yard play, this year he sees the second-level player and hits him for a 15-yard play, and it was a pretty big, I think, third-down conversion, so, or first down regardless. That's a significant progression, and it's not a seemingly a huge deal, but just the fact that they're making teams properly play that is important, and the fact that it lets the receivers get involved with the game, it keeps the safeties back, it just does a million things for the offense, but it's a significant mental progression. Now, the second thing you mentioned, and both of us noted this during the Tennessee game, as far as we can tell, Alabama did not call a single designed run to Jalen Hurts in that game. Not one. And they did very few against Arkansas. They didn't do many against Texas A&M either. First question is whether Jalen's banged up or not. We don't know because they're not really letting us see. But the second point, I think sometimes with Saban, he goes into a game and he thinks he knows whether they're going to win or not. And he always plays up the opponent, but it seems like a lot of times when they play games, and it may be a named opponent like Tennessee, they play call as if they know this is a weak team. And in this case, I think to a certain degree, Alabama was trying to force Jalen to progress as a pocket passer, a traditional pocket passer. Again, there's a perception that Alabama was slow out of the gate, but they really weren't. They There was as really as explosive as they have been in a lot of other games like the Ole Miss game in terms of scoring in their initial possessions. Jalen, in the past when they forced him to do this and they did it a few times, he really struggled. And I think the best example of that was last year, uh, the UT Chattanooga game. Against UT Chattanooga last year, it was really clear watching that game that Alabama really struggled with early and it got some attention. They forced him to play in the pocket. They did not do any designed runs really until the second half because they knew they needed to put the game away. And Jalen struggled pretty badly. He had only had about six and a half. He had 6.5 yards per attempt. He only had 136 yards passing Uh, 15 of 21. He had a high, he had a high completion percentage, but he didn't really have any yards. And, And most of his big plays came late in the game when, you know, the opponent was a little worn out. And again, they opened up the playbook because they were trying to score. I felt like they called an extremely similar offensive game plan against Tennessee and they were far more effective. Again, Chattanooga six and a half yards per attempt Uh, in this game against Tennessee. He was 10.1 yards per attempt. He was 22 of, uh, well, actually let me look at somehow I got thrown off here. Uh, excuse me, 13 of 21, 9.4 yards per attempt, not, not 10.1, 9.4 yards per attempt. I was looking at team stats instead of Jalen's, but you go from six and a half versus UT Chattanooga last year running the style of offense. And this year against Tennessee, you go nine and a half yards per attempt. And I want to clarify Tennessee's pass defense again, statistically really similar to LSU's in terms of a, in fact, almost the exact same number in terms of opponent percentages allowed. And that's not a dig on LSU. Tennessee's just actually pretty darn solid against the pass. Uh, their, their big struggle is the run, particularly the first half, second half. And I think that's one other point. I'll say before I turn it back to you, and that's something else I think you have to understand about Jalen's performance in the Tennessee game if you're an Alabama fan. And I was curious about this because we keep flagging Tennessee. In the first half of games, so first half of Tennessee compared to the first half of all other teams, I'm looking at only first halves from everybody. Tennessee is 59th nationally in yards per carry allowed in the first half. That's not great by any means for an SEC team, but in SEC play where teams run the ball pretty well, 59th nationally is serviceable. The problem is if you look only at second halves, so third and fourth quarters alone from everyone, they fall all the way to 126th nationally in yards per carry allowed. 
And again, I'm not saying UT first half versus everyone's normal per carry. I'm isolating this for everybody. So everybody drops off first half to second half when they get tired. But Tennessee drops off so much that they go from 59th to 126th. It almost certainly has to be the biggest drop off in football. Why do I bring that up? Because a lot of what happened with Jalen in that game or you know, where maybe he couldn't scramble all that well. I mean, Tennessee was a pretty solid defense in first halves this year. Uh, they, they just struggle in second half. So you have to understand, too, with Jalen that he played a serviceable Tennessee team. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of Tua Tagovailoa talk, but Tua faced a completely different defense, essentially, in Tennessee in the second half. Their second half defense is what really struggles. First half's pretty good. Uh, I, I was really impressed from Jalen in that Tennessee game. I think he he showed a lot of poise not where they're not running him. Uh, they took out a big chunk of the playbook and it, frankly, it's a really good sign to see him, even though he didn't you know, necessarily explode to have a lot of success passing in a style of play that he was almost totally unsuccessful uh, doing it last year. All right. So I think we've talked enough about both of these teams sort of in the past and in theory on what we're going to see. Let's talk about the computer model. Just go ahead and line that up and tell us what the computer model says And then go ahead and tell us whether or not you agree with what the computer model thinks. Alabama is who they are at this point, I think. And that's 56% of opponent rush averages allowed, 75% of opponent pass averages allowed. That rush defense is psychotically good, as it has been for the past several years. The pass defense at 75% is elite. In my opinion, probably the best pass defense you know, maybe not necessarily the best athletes, but the corners they have are a lot more consistent and they're better technicians. It's the best pass defense they've had, in my opinion, maybe in the entire Saban era, frankly. I know the pass rush, I think the pass rush maybe isn't as good as they've had at times due to all the injuries, but in terms of just sheer ability to cover and man coverage, I think they're better than they have been in the entire Saban era. Uh, they just, they don't make a lot of stupid mistakes. They play the ball well in the air. And Averett and Wallace are really good technicians, constantly have their eyes in the ball. They redirect players the right way. Uh, and I think, you know, there was actually a game very early in the season, uh, Florida State, that I said that Derwin James was probably going to be turn out to be the second or third best safety in that game. And I know when we did that preview, a lot of Florida State fans called us homers and crazy and a lot of other things. I don't think that's so crazy now because Derwin James obviously is is struggling a little bit of coverage and we all realize how good Fitzpatrick is. And I think really the rest of the secondary is so good that people are missing how good a Ronnie Harrison is, who I also think is potentially a first round draft pick. So they're just really, really darn good. Uh, LSU, I think, is better in some ways. Their their offense is starting to pick up a little bit. I think and Danny Etling has been a far more effective passer for what he's been asked asked to do than anyone appreciates. I, I don't right now, I don't really know why Danny Etling is worse than Jarrett Lee. That's the guy he reminds me of. If, if you want a guy that can play action pass and throw the ball deep to take advantage of an offense or defense that's overcompensating, he's been extremely effective. And I think their issues are again, the rush, the run defense, which is getting better uh, is still giving up right at, right at opponent averages, 99% of opponent averages, which again, not terribly good because you you're comparing yourself against Colorado States and Fresno States. When you say whatever the, your opponent averages normally, you know, whatever Troy averaged in their conference is about what they average against you. It's not a great sign, but the pass defense is still pretty darn good. Uh, and you know, again, yard per attempt, 8.8 yards per attempt is great. Again, the issue is they throw, they run to throw more than two to one. Uh, and, and what does that all sort of turn out to? Well, it, what it comes out to is Alabama's offense is, is almost as good as the defense right now. And so they're expected to average over six yards per carry and over seven yards per pass, which balancing run pass ratio is about 6.6 yards per play. That's pretty darn effective. LSU was not expected to be able to run the ball. No one is, and no one's going to be modeled. Any sane model shouldn't say you can run the ball against Alabama. It's just what they are right now. So 2.8 yards per carry, less than three yards per carry and only 6.6 yards per attempt, which again even as good as that sounds, it's kind of keyed by the fact that they barely ever throw it. So it's only about four yards per play. If you go back and look at how that compares, which is what the model does with how both teams have done through the course of the season, those yardages come out to about to a predicted score of Alabama 37, LSU 10. I think that's pretty fair. I think LSU is a little better, better offensively. Again, I think Canada 
is able to generate offense where they maybe couldn't last year with the same production. However, I don't think LSU's defense is nearly as good as it was last year. And even healthy, I think most LSU fans at this point realize the defense isn't the really elite unit it was the end of last season. Um, and Alabama's offense is frankly better than they were last year. So I think 37 points is kind of in line with that for Alabama. You know, part of me is so used to seeing that blowout score predicted by the model. And part of me just says Alabama LSU is always different. And I imagine our model last year had Alabama beating LSU by more than, than 10 to nothing. And that's not completely fair because I mean, it was a road game and Alabama's defense did their end of the, you know, job. And that was the first game we saw somebody actually slow Jalen hurts down. Um, but I, I have a hard time looking at that number and saying that's what we're going to see in this game just because of and I know we all we always want to throw out history in this game and a computer model isn't going to play into history at all um and LSU fans right now are rolling their eyes cuz they're like we already beat your model once this year uh in the Auburn game but look like we said in the open our model is 15-3 and two pushes this year and, and I would challenge anybody to find anything that's doing that well against Vegas right now. And we're not a gambling channel. We're not trying uh, to give you your picks to go, you know, do a lot of gambling. If you want to use our computer model for that, that's great. But I just say that to illustrate the fact that nobody else on YouTube is out there 15 and three in Vegas right now. So what we're doing, I think has, has a proven track record and so it doesn't mean that we are killing your team. It means that we're going to roll with the thing that's proven, you know, for the last two years to kind of be accurate. Having said all that, I think Geis is a better runner than anything Alabama's seen this year. Uh, Dalen Dawkins from Colorado State ran for 5.9 yards per carry against Alabama. Um, I know he had a long of 29 and – and all that, but, but we've, they haven't really seen a great run attack this year. Uh, and I know Ole Miss had some success there as well, uh, that they weren't expecting. So I think they're going to be able to run the ball a little better than we think this, or than the model thinks. Uh, I think they're probably going to be around four yards per carry and they're probably going to break off a couple of big ones, uh, which is going to keep the ball away from Alabama some because, uh, LSU is going to be able to convert. Give me Alabama 27, uh, hold on, take that back. Give me Alabama 31, LSU 14. And you said you liked the model 3710. Is that the score you're going with, or you just kind of liked sort of? I, I think I'll go with that score. It. Honestly, I, I think it's pretty much right on line. I think LSU is going to put up some points. I mean, I pulled up last year's model. So last year's model, yeah, we didn't have it 10 to nothing. We had it 38 14. And so obviously there's. There's a lot of give and take there, and we've been inaccurate with LSU, as we pointed out this year. I will point out we were inaccurate in that we thought LSU would blow out Mississippi State, and they didn't, and we were inaccurate that we thought Auburn would uh, blow out LSU. But the big key, last year, at the same point against Alabama, LSU was giving up 61% of opponent rush averages. This year, they're giving up 99%. And last year, we kind of knew, and we flagged all year long, that Jalen Hurts might really struggle when his power run offense that he was sort of trying to operate where he was basically a runner first and he was throwing off that and play action, you know, when, when he couldn't get guys to load the box and it wasn't so readily easy because teams were overcompensating LSU was able, able to play them straight up. It wasn't able to, didn't have to overcompensate, found something with the corner blitz and really shut him down this year. I just think LSU was a lot worse equipped to deal with them in the front. LSU's gotten serviceable in run defense, where I think early in the season they were almost deficient or were just deficient. Uh, but still, you need to be really good against the run to slow down Alabama's rush attack overly effectively. Uh, and I don't think they're there, and that's why I think the model is probably a little more accurate this year than they were last year. Again, though, I mean, you never know. It's a computer model. We're sort of making a prediction. And right now, frankly, under Orgeron, this is a very volatile team. So I'll be, one, curious to see how it turns out against the model, and then, two, Almost just as curious to see if they do lose this game, if Ed Orgeron can keep the team on course when they're going to lose a lot of emotional energy. Uh, and I will say, if they get down big, 
I'm going to be curious to see how well they handle, you know, if they get down three touchdowns of keeping the emotion. They did a very good job with it, the Auburn game, but that was really early and they got a got an easy spark uh, to, to keep that going here. You know, if it gets in the second and third quarter and it looks like it's out of reach, you know, can Orgeron keep that ship righted by making them consistent rather than emotional and, and maintain a solid season? All right. So I think um, that's all I have on this game. Any any other things of note or does that pretty much cover um, LSU Alabama? I think that pretty much covers covers everything we need to talk about. I think we've gone 45 minutes at this point, but it's a big game every year. And I, I don't mind talking this long because I think everybody – Everybody looks forward to it, and it's been a crucial game. I don't necessarily see why it won't be. I mean, LSU may have struggled. They're still, you know, only one loss in SEC play. They win this game, and they can control their own destiny uh, in the SEC West. So it's still a very big game. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. And, and we haven't been able to cover a whole lot of Alabama this year because they, because the SEC is actually down, and because of that lack of parity that we've talked about. We haven't had a whole lot of interesting things to say about Alabama this year, so I know LSU fans are rolling their eyes a little bit, and they're 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 probably tired of us at this point. But the fact that we spent this much time on this game is really paying respect to your team and how they've rebounded this year. So, um, I, like you, I think that's all I've got on that one. We, we ran a little long, but but I, I love talking about this game, and 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 I'll go long every year if I have to on it. 